time for episode 78 of Give Me the Hot Sauce. The NBA playoffs about to hit the final four as the conference semifinals are winding down. The Bulls are also in the news with all kinds of crazy rumors involving Zach Levine, and that's probably where we're going to start. But before we do that, I want to make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Give me the hot sauce on YouTube and check it out on your favorite podcast carrier. We're trying to grow the show, grow our subscribers, and so we help help us out in that area. Stacy, uh, the news of the day, we are recording this on Thursday, May 12th. Uh, Shams Charania, uh, our good buddy, reported that Zach Levine is going to have a scope done on, his, on that troublesome left knee in the next couple of weeks. Obviously, he'll be recovered in time for training camp. But uh, this was something, I think, not unexpected at all. He was having trouble with that knee ever since the All-Star break. And I think that this is going to give Zach some peace of mind. And also, as he heads into free agency, he's going to be one of the most marketable guys out there. Yeah, it was no shock. I mean, it was just a matter of when he's going to do it. Um, it's nothing to be concerned about. It's not like he's having ACL surgery. Um, it's just a clean out, try to find out why he was having so much dis- discomfort during the playoffs. Um, so he's going to make a full recovery. Um, I think the you know the key right now, you know, just talking to Bulls Nation via Twitter and and interacting with Bulls fans. Everybody's there's all these different trade scenarios. Panic and, too. Oh, yeah. oh, Zach's leaving. Yeah, Zach's leaving. Oh, we got to sign him. Blah, blah. Yeah. You know what? And I tell Bulls Nation all the time, just uh, chill. You know, right. No, don't yeah. listen to fake news. Um, you know, Zach is going to get the max deal. Bulls are going to offer him the max deal. Um, so don't worry about that. It, it'll be in Zach's, you know, you know, in his wheelhouse. If he wants the max deal, um, it'll be there for him. The Bulls want him. The city of Chicago wants him. Bulls Nation wants him. It's a no-brainer. It's a team now that is starting to win. It's trending up with the way the front office is putting this team together. They've got a, their core group of guys back. They'll have, you know, two uh, uh, mid, you know, mid-level exceptions. I think they'll be able to sign a good free agent, two couple of good free agents. Uh, they got the 18th pick in the draft, which we talked about last week. That could possibly be, you know, a top 10 pick that happens to slide sure, down there, yeah. and they do their homework. I mean, look what we did with Io last year. So um, they're going to take advantage of that. But at the same time, you know, listen, I think you're starting to see, you know, how other people look at Zach. You know how other teams look at Zach. You hear San Antonio; they'll have some cap space. Portland's name popped up there. The yeah, other it was day. the Brian Windhorst thing yeah, uh, from yeah, ESPN, yeah. where he said that executives believe that Zach is in play. Well, sure, they can make their offers, yes. but the Bulls can offer him more exactly. money than any other team in the league. Exactly, and then let's, let's just say you know worst case scenario. Let's say you know Zach says, "Hey, you know what? I, I want to leave." Okay, you you know. If it's not a sign and trade deal, you're you're talking about leaving over fifty million dollars sure. on the table. Yeah. I don't care who, what you're thinking. You're not going to leave fifty million dollars. You're not going to be able to make that up somewhere else. And I don't care what anyone tells you. Oh, you come to Portland, the endorsements there. Come no, on, man, no, no not Portland. So. Okay, so so <laughs> at the same time, you got to look at that. And if you're talking about a sign and trade, and this is what I got in a conversation with people there on Twitter. You know, you talk about a sign and trade. If it doesn't benefit the Bulls. Why would you even entertain it? Right. You know, if 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 the Lakers, why do the Bulls want to help the Lakers? Okay. If Anthony Davis, and I know a lot of people, well, he's injured all the time. He's still a superstar player. He's still a top five player in this league. If if I'm the Bulls front office, and I'm not, I'm just saying, I'm just sitting in my little chair. You know, if I'm talking to Rob Palinka about a trade, a sign and trade, Zach wants to go to L.A. His agent is pushing for him to go to L.A. If we're not talking to Anthony Davis, we're not talking at all. No. That phone calls click. Yeah. Uh, drive home safely. Beep beep. I'm not. I'm not even talking to you about it. If Anthony Davis's name is not in in that conversation, we're not talking because I'm giving you a two time All Star. I'm giving you one of the best two guards in the league. I'm helping you. I'm I'm giving you a stud, and you're gonna give me a bag of Doritos. Like you're gonna give me THT and whoever a Russell Westbrook. We we don't need Russell Westbrook. No, we, no. we've got we've already got guy, we've yeah. already got Lonzo Ball. Right. What we need, we need a power forward. And and if you did a head up swap, I don't know how the numbers uh, work, Mark. I don't know what the salaries are, but I'm sure if you if Zach gets a a max deal. Uh, I think AD's contract would somehow would be able to match up with that, and maybe they have to throw another player in. But I'm not talking to you unless it's star for star. And and why wouldn't you go to other teams? Why wouldn't you go to? Let's say it's just off the top of my head, um, the Wizards. You know, go to the Wizards and say, okay, I'll trade you head up. You know, Zach for Bradley Beal. Right. You know, right. so if you're the Bulls, you got to look at a situation that's going to help your franchise because there's not a Zach Levine walking through the door. 
You know, we, we, we got very lucky when we traded Jimmy. We didn't get any all-stars at a trade for trade. And everybody thought we got the worst end of the year. We gave Jimmy Butler. He's an all-star. Yeah. You know, at the time, it looked like that. But you look what we got in return. We got Zach Levine, who now turned out, under the Bulls' guidance, a two-time all-star and Olympian. So he basically, um, you know, developed under the Bulls' flag. And so now we got an all-star. So we, we it's basically an all-star for an all-star. It didn't look like that in the beginning, but it turned out that way. Lowry Marketing, very good player. is going to be a good player in this league. So we got some good pieces back. But if you're not getting a star for a star, I, if I'm the Bulls, I'm not going to be forced to make a deal, a sign and trade. Yeah, and this is a very savvy front office. They're not going to be uh, – uh you know, taken blindsided and somebody stealing them away. They're going to have conversations with other teams that might be interested. And if, as Stacy mentioned, if he's going to leave, they're going to work out a sign and trade so they'll get some kind of asset back. But I think, you know, we've talked to Zach so many times. He loves Chicago. He's not scared by the, you know, the, the legend of Michael Jordan or anything like that. He, he likes being in a big market. He likes trying to get the Bulls back on top. And I think that things will ultimately work out where he stays with the Bulls. Let's talk a little bit about the playoffs. Uh, as we mentioned, the conference semifinals are winding down. A bunch of three games to two leads. I thought that... Uh, Miami and Phoenix in the last game showed that they're they're clearly the better teams in those series. Where as I mentioned, Game Six in those series is tonight. You think uh, Miami and Phoenix will close them out? I think Miami eventually wins that series. Um, it's unfortunate because you know Joel Embiid got hurt right. and missed the first two games, which pushed you know Philadelphia behind the eight ball. Had he been healthy, maybe it's a different series. But you know, would have, could have, should have. You know, Doc Rivers, when this season's over, is going to look back on this season and go, why did I have this guy out there on the floor? Right. We're up 29 points yeah. with four minutes to go, clearly winning this game. There was no reason for him to be out there. And you so, probably got uh, some advice from Tom Thibodeau. Well, you know, exactly. Former well, assistant. you know what? I don't know why I don't know why any coach, after seeing what happened to the Bulls with Derrick Rose, would ever have their right. star player out there in a meaningless game that they were already winning. It doesn't make any sense. Are you padding stats for MVP? Is that what it was? Because now... Now look at it. He didn't win MVP. Now you're probably going to get bounced out the playoffs because he's not 100%. Right. And, you know, this it just killed your opportunity. Because I honestly thought Philadelphia could beat Miami just because of him. And, you know, he's not 100%. Um, as far as, like, Phoenix is concerned and, and Golden State, you know, those are the two teams that I believe that are going to play, you know, in the Western Conference Finals. Sure. Um, even though uh, Memphis came back and put a whooping on Golden yeah, State Yeah, Golden last State night. just mailed it in. Yeah, it was My like, goodness. you know, it was kind of like they just, like, well, we don't feel like playing yeah, We tonight. got game six in San Francisco. You can have but, this one. But the, the scary thing about that is, is that, you know, John Moran is not playing. Right. And for their players to step up, you got to remember, people forget about this Memphis team. They, they had a winning record way above 500 without John Moran. And it's been very well documented. Like, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? They were winning without John Moran. So when you when you see that kind of team, that team showed up yesterday. And if you're Golden State, if you're just banking on the fact we're going to wait till we get home, because you remember Game Seven is in Memphis, right? Okay, so you you your chance to close out a team and what a team like you know Golden State, which was very surprising because they're a veteran team. They've been in championships before. They've been in championship closeout series. To not go in there and take care of business when you had a team on the ropes. Their star players out. You had just beat them. And, you know, I know Steve Kerr wasn't there um, because of the COVID uh, protocol. But, you know, I mean, you got to close that game out because now you give this team some hope. They go back into to Golden State where they won during the regular season and – they could win that game. Now it's seven. Pressure burst pipes. You get in the game seven in their home court. Now they got all the confidence. Speaking of pressure, it got to the Boston Celtics on Wednesday. Ooh. They had a 14-point lead in the fourth quarter. They were up six with two minutes to go. And then Giannis, hits, he was two for 17 on threes. He hits a three. Drew Holiday hits a three. And then our old guy Bobby Portis gets a rebound and a missed free throw and puts Milwaukee ahead. That was a stunning collapse. It's going to be tough for them to regroup in time for Friday night in Milwaukee. Well, I tell you what. I mean, Boston had an opportunity to to really kind of tighten the screws. You know, they'd won, they'd won the last game in Milwaukee, so they tied the series up. They had a chance to win in Boston. Now you go back to Milwaukee and got a chance to close them out, you know, and – you blew it. I mean, I, I was saying before when we were talking on, you know, before the show was on, we were talking about, you know, how Drew Holiday is one of the most underrated guards in the league. You know, doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Um, should yeah, be those up, two defensive I plays mean, at the end were amazing. He, he's been that way the whole yeah. playoffs. I mean, he really was the difference in our series as far as his mm -hmm. play was concerned. His defense on on 
DeMar and Zach, um, his rebounding, his getting guys and hitting timely shots. I mean, he hit big shots in our series, and he's doing the same thing in, in Boston. I think, you know, he had those those critical steals, the one he stole at half court from uh, Marcus Smart. I mean, yeah. just ripped him, just took took his candy from him, you know, which um, you don't see a lot of people doing that to Marcus and Smart. And the block, to stay in bounds, yes. and then to throw it off Smart. Yes, yes. I Amazing. mean, just, just, he just he just makes so many winning plays that translates to wins for your team. And when I tell people, you know, that's how Lonzo Ball is for us. We have a Drew Holiday in Lonzo Ball. So Bulls Nation who is like, you know, oh, what about Zach? We're all panicking. Yeah. You know, you got to remember, we got some key pieces coming back that are going to be 100% next year. And, you know, Lonzo's one of them. And when you look at how Drew plays and how Lonzo plays, very similar. They're both big guards. Lonzo's bigger than him, though. Lonzo's six foot six. Mm-hmm. Second leading rebounder on our team in 35 games. Only played 35 games. Second leading rebounder behind Vooch. He was he was leading shot blocker before he went out. And and that's from the guard spot. Um, the guy is can play anybody on the floor just like Drew Holiday. He can guard anybody on the floor and makes it difficult for you to have to to get into your sets. You don't have to double team when you got a guy on a switch that gets switched on, say, Giannis in the post. You don't have to compromise your defense by running down there doubling because he's got the size disadvantage. He can guard and hold his own. So when we come at you next week, we'll have the uh, final matchup set for the Eastern Conference and Western Conference Finals. We're winding down in the NBA playoffs. we got something different coming up for you next. Uh, Chicago native Aries Spears, one of the most talented comedians working these days. He's going to join us, entertain us, hopefully with some of his impressions and tell us about life on the road as a comic. That's coming up next on Give Me the Hot Sauce. But first, I want to remind you when it comes to insurance for your auto, home, and business, make sure you contact the king of insurance. That's nationwide agent Jeff Vukovic at jeffvuk.com. That's Jeff V U K. Dot com. Stacy, Golden Pipes. Nationwide is on your side. <laughs> 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 Little freelance today. Little freelance. Yeah. Pablo, don't sweat over there. I know you like to hear the Golden Pipes. Don't, don't sweat. Look at it. He's over there. Oh, I love that voice. <laughs> <laughs> He's loading the- Are you loading the gun? <laughs> oh, you punching me! Oh, wow, wow! We give this guy hey, too much save, credit. Save control. the comedies to our next guest, <laughs> Ari Spears, in the on deck circle in the Sriracha waiting room. That's next on episode seventy eight of Give Me the Hot Sauce. Hey, we got a special treat for you. Episode 78 of Give Me the Hot Sauce rolls on, and we want to welcome in. You've seen him on TV. You've seen him in movies. You've seen him in performing in comedy clubs. The great Aries Spears joins us now. Aries, welcome to the show, and, and tell us how you first uh, met Stacy King. How'd you guys cross paths? Uh, you know, I'm a regular uh, at the uh, Schomburg Improv there in Schomburg, Illinois, um, and, and unbeknownst to me, uh, one of the many times I had performed there, it just so happened somebody put the bird in my ear that <laughs> Stacey King was in the audience. So me being the Bulls fanatic that I am, I had to make you know make sure I, I let him know that uh, I was appreciative of his presence. And, uh, you know, I wanted to slap hands with the man because, <laughs> you know, like I said, I'm a diehard Jordan fanatic and uh, I knew that man very well. Yeah, we we talk about it. You're, I mean, honestly, I tell you know, I tell me and Tim, my guy over here, Timmy Whispers, we go to every show when he comes here. He's one of my favorite guys, yeah. and uh, doesn't you know? A lot of people don't know he's very talented. Like you know, they, certain people have certain guys they like listening to. Like I like him. I like him as a comedian because his is raw and uncut, and it's just. I mean, he'll have you laughing. He hits every topic. Uh, the last time you came, I don't even think you did. I don't even think you did any impersonations. It was just straight comedy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't. I don't like to ever force that issue. You know, if I have something that I feel like I've been working on it, or that organically fits what I'm doing comedically, I do it. But until I can really, you know, fine tune it and hone it in and get it to where I'm really satisfied about it. I don't just like to do it just to do it. And a lot of people will yell out because, you know, they got their fan favorites. Yo, do this one or do that one or do this one. But, you know, I, 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 I'm trying to work on some, some new ones. And uh, before we started, one of which I did for you, uh, which I wish you had been there, because <laughs> I really unveiled it 
for the first time in Schomburg was my Dennis Robin. And then, of course, one of my, my newest favorites is uh, James Gandolfini, a.k.a. Tony Soprano. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely one I, I would love to hear. You know, tell our listeners a little bit, you know, about your story and, and how you got into uh, comedy and, um, you know, just a little bit about you. Because a lot of people, a lot of people in Chicago know who you are because I know every time I've come to that show, it's been sold out. Like, it sells out quickly. Well, here's, here's the crazy thing, um, and I don't share this with a lot of people, but, you know, I claim New York City when people go, yo, where you from? New York, New York. Because, you know, I was I was basically raised in New York since I was a toddler. Uh, but where I'm originally from is Chicago. Yep. Uh, I, was born on, I was born on the south side of Chicago, uh, Cook Hospital, but I left when I was, I was a baby. So I really grew up in New York, and New York City was like my stomping grounds. So I tell people, you know, home is where you lay your hat. Even yeah. though I know deep down inside, I'm a Chicagoan, uh, New York raised me. It's like, when I, I, you know, people get shocked when they hear that, you know, Michael Jordan, he claims North Carolina, but he's really from Brooklyn. Yeah. You know, he grew up, he was born in New York. So home is where you lay your hat, man. But, you know, um, yeah, I, I think part of the reason why, why I've been so fortunate enough to, to have good turnouts uh, there in Chicago is, is is more of a testament to, you know, my longevity, being on Def Comedy Jam, being on Shaq Saw Star Comedy Jam, and 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 uh, having the kind of material that, like you said, is raw and real, and that people cling to, especially in a day and age where we live in this moist climate of sensitivity and over the top political correctness and wokeness. I'd love to be able to say this because I'm the hometown hero so to speak, but not a lot of people know that I'm actually from Chicago. That's awesome. I imagine the uh, the whole Will Smith, Chris Rock, Oscars episode must be great fodder for comedians. Have you uh, incorporated any of that into your act? Um, You know, you, I, I addressed the elephant in the room when it first happened because you kind of have to. But to be honest, uh, comedians being attacked physically is nothing new. Yeah, uh, That's always been, I mean, it doesn't happen at a rampant uh, pace. But it does happen. Um, it's just the Will Smith, Chris Rock thing gave it a commercial. So once you get an endorsement, now everybody wants to try to be Will Smith. Yeah, that, that's my question to you because, um, you know, when you're on stage and you pick a person out and you start, you know, you start in on them, okay? And everybody's laughing. The guy that you're, you know, the guy that you're, you know, you know, taking the task is laughing, you know. Is it when it's over, the show is over, that guy might have been upset about something you said or you put him on blast? I mean, because that's just, to me, I don't see how anyone, when you go to a comedy club, you put yourself in that position to, you know, get made fun of. And I don't see how anybody could get really upset about it. You know, the the, the most surprising thing, and, and I use this line in my standup, is, is the look of shock on people's faces, uh, particularly the, the ones that are victims when they're sitting in the front row and, and they have this look of bewilderment on their face. Like, how could you do this? And I always tell people, look, you got courtside seats. You're going to be part of the game. Exactly. You know I mean? So at any point, yeah. So at any point, and I think most people know in terms of etiquette, that's what comes with the territory. But, you know, I, I agree with Charles Barkley. Most people are stupid. So, you know, they, 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 they're not prepared for something that you would think they would be prepared for. That that's I mean that just blows me away because after looking at Dave Chappelle, you know all jokes aside and everything, I mean to have a guy who's a well known comedian who who's bigger than life, you know when it comes to comedy, uh, to be in that environment and have a guy run up on stage like that with all the security that he travels with, with all the the stuff. Now the guy who jumped up on stage, I, I you know at that moment when you remember they say at that moment. He knew he fucked up. That that was one of those moments. Hey, Once he missed the tackle, that that was it for him. He got he got touched by a lot of Mac Mittens. Yes, he got beat down, man. He, I mean, I saw some of the memes. He, he was on the one of the memes. He was on the uh, cover of the Ghetto Boys album. He was uh, Bushwick Bill. Yeah, that was, funny. Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> That was Internet hilarious. Something else, boy, when it comes to these jokes. Oh, uh, they're undefeated. But but my point, uh, Aries, is that 
the fact that do you ever worry about that? Because you, Dave Chappelle is kind of like that, that comedian that deals with like politics and everything like that. You are raw. Like you, you the dude, like if we was playing dozens back in high school, like, you know, how you talk about somebody, mama, their brother, the sister, you are that kind of yeah. attack style person that you could see someone getting offended by what you may say, even though they, they would know like, okay, this part of territory, but he coming at me really hard here. Right. I've had uh, I've had about seven attacks, uh, attempted attacks. Wow. Um, where guys wanted to fight me after the show. Some tried to rush the stage. One of the most gangster places ever that you wouldn't think of is in Canada, Edmonton, <laughs> Canada. I had two, you know, I had two white girls. One come rush the stage, and the other throw a pitcher of beer at me. But you know, when white folks get liquor in them. Especially white women, they turn back to 1965. <laughs> <laughs> so it gets it gets personal per se to them when they, because alcohol it makes gets, everybody yeah. brave. You know, it gives everybody that liquid courage. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, man. Uh, so it happens, man. It, I mean, again, it doesn't happen as often as you would think. Um, not enough to where it's it's that serious of an issue, but when. Uh, Will Smith did what he did. He put it. He put it on Front Street. How did? How did? How would you have responded? Because I like you know everybody puts themselves in that situation. Like if that would have been me, I would have done you know right. something. Like how would you have responded uh, if that would have happened to you? You're on stage and you know you're at the Oscars. You know you're in the black tie, and then all of a sudden here comes a guy that you respect that is you know uh, one of the best actors of our generation walks up on stage unprompted. And then, like, swings on you. You know, I, I think that, and this is where you have to take your hat off to Chris. I think given the gravity of the moment, he handled it the right way. Because I know that, and, I, and jokingly to me, I said even the way it went down, and even though it didn't escalate, look, look man, we got to be honest. This is where you get your cold hard truth. I know for that night, secretly, wink, wink, behind closed doors, there had to be some white folks with the attitude of, you see how they act? Yeah. And turn the Oscars into the Source Awards. Yeah. So that was a bad enough look for us. But if Chris had decided to retaliate physically, it would have been the, the most disastrous event ever. Even though, and I'm going to put this on a sidebar, you know, look, the Oscars was produced by uh, Will Packer. Yep. Uh, first time it's ever been produced by one of the biggest black producers in the game, you know, you had two of the three black, uh, two of the three female hosts who were black, uh, something that's never been done before, Wanda Sykes and, and, and Regina Hall. Then you had Will Smith winning his award. Sam Jackson, who should have been won an award, got an award and was presented by Denzel, which we never saw. So this was a big night for the black community. And to have it stain like that, uh, I think it's 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 very unfortunate because while there are people who may pretend like race won't come into it, race has always been a factor in American culture and Hollywood and American life. So it is a bad look for us. But on the other note that I was going to make, I can't let white people off completely off the hook because for those of of them who have made who may have said, "Oh, this was the darkest," and some of them did. This was the darkest moment in Oscar's history, I would beg to differ. I would beg to differ that not letting Hattie McDaniel, who won for Supporting Actress, first black woman to win for Supporting Actress, wasn't allowed to sit with her castmates from Gone with the Wind because she was black. And then in her acceptance speech, someone wrote that she would say the words, and I'm a credit to my race. So before we play that game, let's make sure we have all the, de the cards on the table. Yeah. As, as bad as the Will Smith moment was, to say it was the worst thing ever, I beg to differ. Aries, we were looking at uh, your credits and, and the dozens of great impersonations you did during your time with Mad TV. This is a big time for basketball fans with the NBA playoffs going on. You see inside the NBA just about every night with the TNT crew. Can you give us a little, uh, can you give us a little Shaquille O'Neal going at Charles Barkley? Uh, can you give us a little bit of that? You know, I tell like every time, Joe and me got to get 20 to 
I don't care how big you are, just as a big man, you got to get 2810. <laughs> if you don't dominate with 2810, then you're in a real big man. And Chuck, you don't know nothing about winning championships. You ain't never won a championship. I want championships, Kobe. I want championship with D-Wade. You don't know nothing about being a champion. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about... You know, let, me tell you, what, what, let me tell you something. First of all, Ernie, can I... You, first of all, <laughs> you look at the defense, a lot of teams don't play. They talk about hiring Mike D'Antoni to come in for the Lakers. <laughs> first of all, LeBron James... Let, let, let me tell you something. First of all, LeBron James is the greatest athlete uh, since Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. <laughs> um, I think it's very interesting that they're going to – because all them old guys that play for that, they, they shouldn't have been – but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. Those are great. Uh, hit me with the Jay-Z, because I love when you do Jay-Z. Jay-Z, I, I think that's one of your better ones. Open the building, take me back down. So good, hoping the building would be American <laughs> Anthem. You know what it is, your boy. <laughs> Which which ones do you like to do the most? Which one is the hottest request? Uh, the newest ones. Uh, I'm always a fan of something new. Uh, that's why I said, like I said, Tony Soprano, uh, rest in peace, James Gandolfini. But you know, then I was watching a Soprano. I thought to all my guys, Uncle June, uh, you know, Bali, uh, Silvio, <laughs> Christopher, even my sister Janice. What we're doing right now is for the shake of the face. But we're not in New York or New Jersey. We're over at you know at the restaurant watching the games. I like Shaquille O'Neal, Michael Jordan. I love them all. This black guy sure can jump. <laughs> <laughs> that's that a good Tony. That, on, man. That's a good Tony Soprano. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Hey, Timmy Whispers. Yeah, dude, Dennis Rodman. Now, right after he got headbutted by uh, Stacy. No, he headbutted me and got know, two piece. I'm okay, reversing. There's a difference. It there's a difference. When I played by the I was actually about to actually won something for the Bulls. I mean, you're gonna get me a dab. You're gonna get me a dab. All that pop. I didn't care. You know, Phil so asked me when I couldn't play for the Bulls. I said, I don't give a damn. I don't care. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> did, did you hear Did you hear Jamie Foxx's impersonation of Dave Chappelle? Uh, yeah, it was pretty good. Man, that was pretty really good. good. He sounded just like yeah. him. I could yeah, not believe. Yeah. That was pretty good, yeah. Do you do you when you look at these guys like I mean there's Frank uh, Caliendo who's very good at what he does. Um, there's some other guys out there, but I, I put George right up there with the best. Yeah, Jay Farrell's amazing. A few yes. Crockett. Uh, there's a brother out of out of out of New York that nobody really knows about. He's up and coming. His name he goes by the name C King. When I tell you this man does Denzel Washington, I mean he does it as good as Frank Caliendo does John Madden. Oh, like wow. of all the black comedians that I know of that do Denzel, myself, Dean Edwards, brother out of Chicago, Reggie Reg, uh, uh, Godfrey, he puts all of us to shame, man. Like I, I, I had, to, I, I was so embarrassed that I had to retire my Denzel because his is that, his is that <laughs> really, good, man. It's scary, man. You should check him out. He's on Instagram. It's uh, uh I am C King. I am underscore C K I N G. Phenomenal. We also talk about, you know, we, we, you know, I see on your your Instagram, I follow you on Instagram, and you know, you're always in debate with fans about MJ and LeBron, and you know, who's the goat and who's, you know, who's the better of the two. Um, give us your take on that. Give us your 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 take on who you feel is the best and why. I, I think it's MJ, and I think the key component in that is a word called totality. Uh, you know, people make these arguments, and I look at it like an award-winning chili recipe or a gumbo recipe. In order to have the perfect gumbo or chili, it takes a bunch of ingredients. And people will say, well, Kareem should be the best because he has six titles and blah, blah, blah. And I go, yeah, but Kareem didn't transform the game the way Jordan did. He didn't take it global the way Jordan and the Bulls did. Part of the reason for that is because Kareem was very aloof. Kareem wasn't a media guy. He wasn't a friendly guy. And, and, you know, no fault to his own, but he also didn't come up in an age where cable exploded. So in terms of what Michael Jordan did for the game globally, as well as skillfully and all the other areas, people will say, well, if it's all about rings, why not Robert Ory? He has seven. Russell has 11. Well, again, there's a difference between being the reason you win and winning for a reason. Yes, you need role players to be successful. But when you look at guys like Magic, Bird, Jordan, Kobe, Shaq, Hakeem, 
They were the reasons their teams won. They were the franchise. Robert Ory, right place, right time. He won for a reason. There's a difference. You know, Bill Russell came in an era where, you know, he was, what, one of maybe two, three black guys in the whole league. And when you got Larry Bird, uh, the Larry legend saying, you know, basketball is a black man's game. The best players are black. Well, if you played in an era where because of segregation, there weren't a lot of black men to compete against, that to me throws an asterisk above your greatness. And you played in an era where you played far less games, you know, and and, and let's face it, he was a giant amongst little people because I know you can't say the M word, but he was a giant amongst little people. You know, again, I don't diminish his greatness, but when you look at the totality, it's Jordan rings. It's, you know, uh, global polarization. It's the statistics, the analytics, everything in terms of a total package. Yeah, that's a good argument. I'm always going to pick MJ. I don't really care what anybody says, you know, because I, I think we live in an era where, <laughs> you know, it's what have you done for me lately? You know, I mean, if it well, wasn't. Let me say this. Let me say this. Let me say this. When you guys do this podcast, is it live or is it you can edit it? We can edit it. All right. Well, this part may be just for you because I'm not. I, I don't. I'm assuming that you won't be able to air this part. But this is the part when you talk about my style of comedy being raw and uncut. When people bring up LeBron James and they go four and six, I guess that's his, his finals record. And Michael Jordan is six and zero. Oh. And yes, it's impressive that he got there ten times. But he's still four and six. So I say to those guys, would you really would you rather have a really big dick that works sometimes <laughs> four and six or an average dick that works all the time six and oh? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good analogy. <laughs> you got edited right off the screen for that. <laughs> hey, Pablo, did you edit him off? No, no, no. Somebody's oh. calling me. Oh, oh yeah. We've, thought, we've had thought, that I happen before. Yeah, I thought DJ no, Paul no. would cut him off. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> no, that was LeBron interrupting the transmission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So so tell tell our listeners uh, where they can catch your shows at uh, upcoming shows and about your podcast, because I know you got a podcast, too. So uh, Yeah, the, little... podcast is, uh, the, the podcast is called uh, Spears and Steinberg. Uh, A.K.A. the Jew and the Jerk. Uh, it's available <laughs> on all streaming platforms. And I always tell people, you know, you can always hit me up on the Instagram, Ari Spears, and uh, hit me up in my DMs, and I'll chop it up with you and also send you the links. Uh, Another but phone yeah, call. It's called Spears and Steinberg. Yeah. This is, oh, this is a spam now. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Me, so where, where's, your you where's your next show? Where's your next show's at? Where can they catch you at? Um, I'm going to be in uh, Louisville, Kentucky this weekend, uh, Friday through Sunday. And then I'm going to be, uh, in, uh, the stress factory in New Brunswick, New Jersey, the following weekend, and then helium in Philly the following weekend. Okay. Hey, Aries, before you go, we got a group of students here from uh, Harper college. And one of the guys told me that you do the best Eddie Murphy he's ever heard. Could you give us a little Eddie Murphy? You know, it's, hard, it's hard to do Eddie now because my voice has changed so <laughs> dramatically over the years. It's almost like, you know, a young uh, Serpico or a Dog's Day Afternoon Pacino, the Godfather, when his voice was really high. Sure. Yeah. Because of all the cigars and brandy, you know, it's real <laughs> gruff now. So my voice has changed over the years, man. But, you know, listen, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm going to um, Louisville, Kentucky this weekend and i know that's home of the greatest boxer to ever live uh, i never could do a young ali uh quite like billy crystal but i kind of felt in ali's old age you know he was kind of like you know i'm still the greatest i fought all the great fighters i fought challenge <laughs> miles i fought son this is joe fraser i've been knocked down plenty of times but never been knocked out i'm so pretty i'm still mean still the greatest greatest fighter ever joe fraser so you know, I, that's a good one. So that's, yeah. that's kinda, I do a slower island. So when you when you go to a city, do you you know look at you know whoever like like you're going to Louisville, you see Ali. Do you go to like New York and you pick like one guy that may be a fan favorite, and then you know that's part of the show? No, not really. Uh, again, I, I I don't ever want to force anything. So if it doesn't come to me organically, uh, I try to stay away from it. 
<clears throat> I try to stay away from it because I, if I can't do it justice, I, I don't want to do it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, That's I remember cool. uh, the first time I went to Kentucky. Uh, they, of course, they had uh, Muhammad Ali Boulevard. And, and you know, I already knew that this is where Ali was from. So I told everybody I tried to take a picture of the sign, but it was hard to get a still picture because the sign kept shaking. <laughs> Oh, no, okay. Wow. Oh, oh, hey, hey, come on, man. Hey, hey, that was a delayed punch right there, boy. I, I found a yeah. guy. I was like, I, I said, did, okay, I know where he went with that one. Oh, Lord. That, oh, Lord. You know, that's, you know, dirty. that's dirty, boy. That's dirty. That's dirty. That's dirty. You ain't going to say that joke in uh, Louisville. You might have somebody try to oh, do a day in Chappelle. Do. I absolutely do. I absolutely do. <laughs> you going to do it? For real? I always do it. Listen, I don't run from nothing. Because <laughs> you know what? I can't do it for y'all. I can't do it for y'all because it's a little lengthy and it's really hardcore. But I do a joke about Martin Luther King. And basically the punchline uh, was his assassination. And I've done it in Atlanta. Wow. And they loved it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's... <laughs> Edgier, the edgier something is, the more risque it is, it better be funny. Yeah. Because if you're going to tackle something that's really taboo, dangerous, edgy, controversial, you can get away with it, but it better be funny. Yeah, that's that's true now because every I mean, pretty much we're in a, a point in society now where you have to watch what you say and be politically correct or you'll be canceled. You know, so how how that's the question I want to ask you. How does that impact a comedian? Because are you exempt to that like everybody else is? You know, if I say something that offends a certain group, you can say, Oh, cancel him, cancel culture. How does that work for a comedian? Well, I think I think to some degree that's a double edged sword. Like when you look at Dave Chappelle and you look at the fact that Netflix Netflix paid him $60 million for three specials. Now, is Dave cancelable? Anybody can be canceled depending on how, how outrageous whatever it is you say. But when you also generate that kind of revenue for a company, you have a, you have a lot more leeway than most people. Most people ain't getting paid $60 million for three specials. Yeah. So they're not going to be quick to cancel Dave uh, unless he really said something truly outlandish and, 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 and out, you know, out of pocket. You know, me, I don't think my career is where, you know, I, I, at this point, I don't, I'm not on anything. You know, I don't have nothing to lose. So I'm real Floridian with my comedy. I stand my ground. That's awesome. That's awesome. Cause I, I tell you what, man, cause like, like I said, you know, I've been to your shows and, and nothing's off uh, limits. I mean, nothing is off limits. Yeah, we can't breathe. Yeah. I'm laughing so hard. Yeah. It's, but I'm, it's, listen, I'm old school, man. I'm, I'm old school, man. I, I come from that Richard Pryor, Red Fox, Eddie Murphy, George Carlin era, you know, and that to me was the best kind of comedy. The comedy that kind of either made you snicker or made you feel like you had to go listen in privacy. I don't, I don't know how hip, Timothy and Mark are uh, to this guy I'm about to mention. I'm sure Stacy, you might know him, and they might know him too. Remember the rap group when they was kids, Crisscross? Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they wore their clothes backwards. backwards. Yeah. So I remember uh, when the news came out that one of the kids had passed, uh, passed away, and I remember I was, as a matter of fact, I was in a club in New Jersey where I'm going to be at the Stress Factory, and this was probably three days after the news hit. So I, I don't remember the guy's name, but I said to the crowd. Hey, did y'all hear about so and so from the rap group Crisscross? Yeah, yeah. They say he just passed away. The audience was like, "Yeah." So I gave it a beat, and then I went, "Damn, I wonder if they're gonna put him in the casket backwards." <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> oh hey, whoa! Hey Aries, you had uh, Stacy and I crying, laughing too, listening to the very private Bill Cosby tapes. Oh yeah, the the, the Cosby <laughs> tapes. Man, I hey, I must have listened to that damn thing for like a hundred times, dude. Oh, Camille, wait a minute, yeah. Cam, Cam, Camille's coming. Camille's I did coming. Not put oh. it in the bucket. I did not no, put it I in the bucket. To you, I want to make a public <laughs> sandwich, and I want you to have the nuts. How about it? Yeah, that was fun. dude, that was so hilarious. Oh, we, man. I mean, seriously, me and Tim listened to that like. 
I mean, like we were listening to like a movie, man. It was like, and everything was like so on point. You know, he's he's talking to he's talking to the girl, one of the girls, and then all of a sudden, oh, gotta go. Camille's in the room. <laughs> Camille's coming. In fact, one of the girls, one of the girls before she blew up was uh, Tiffany Haddish. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, she's one of the callers. <laughs> oh wow, dude! That I, I tell you, that was hilarious, dude. I mean. That that was that was awesome, man. I, I tell you what, you 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 are big time in my eyes, man. And anytime you come to Chicago, you know I'm at that show. I love it, brother. I love it. Cause we came, wasn't it right after COVID? He came like yeah, right, yeah. And and we you know we were there when he came from right. It was just right after when everybody could come in back into uh, the Schomburg uh, venue. We came back, and uh, yeah, that was a good one. He was yeah. talking about he was talking about handicapped people oh, 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 and yeah. McDonald's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember that? He's talking about a handicapped kid at McDonald's. Oh, McDonald's. 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 <laughs> I hope one day they, they really get a club in the city though, man. Because Schaumburg is such a drive away yeah. Yeah. from the city. The show is over. I'm kind of trapped in Schaumburg because it's not worth it to take the drive and come into Chicago when everything's gonna be closed. That's really that's really surprising because I uh Chicago's got some comedy clubs uh, in the city. Yeah, yeah, they got some, but nothing as big as Schaumburg. No, 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 because Schaumburg's is you know they got all the restaurants right over there. You know, people go over to PF Chang's and you know the uh, Texas Day Brazil's right there. And plus, it's easy to get in and get out of um, after the show because yeah. normally you have normally there's three three shows, and so people can go eat early and then go catch the show. Uh, cause the food, I ain't gonna lie, the food's terrible in there. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, it got it's so bad. Hey, I got I got to bring mine on in. I'm sneaking it in, man. I'm sneaking my food in. I'm bringing PF Chang's in. You know they don't stop me though. They don't do no Rodney King on me. I know if they catch me, they probably would though. Well, you, you know what, Stacy? I think I, I might have asked you this before, and I'm not sure if I did. But but if I didn't, or if I did, let me just ask it again so I'm clear. And I and I, I told you, and you know from following me, I'm. I, I'm a Michael Jordan fanatic, yep. and I've never met Michael, uh, and I've always wanted to, but I've heard so many mixed stories. Is he a cool dude, or is he a dick like some some of the stories I've heard? I'll be honest with you. Um, in the beginning, the first go-around, the first championship run, he was he was difficult to play with. He wasn't a good teammate, you know what I'm saying? And then when he went to go play right. baseball, um, and he wasn't the main guy, I think that really humbled him in the baseball, you know, baseball field because he wasn't the number one guy. He was the guy on the end of the bench, you know, and even though it was Michael Jordan, he didn't get, you know, he, he still, you know, he was the one of the worst guys on the team. And I think that humbled him a little bit because the second go around, he was a much better teammate uh, in the second championship. Cause I think he, he realized like how difficult it is to be a role player playing with a guy like himself. Uh, but you know what, though? You have to be strong mentally to play with guys like that. Not everybody can do that. You know, I mean, a lot of us, are the, no, those I'm, guys. I'm, I'm, go ahead. No, no. I'm, I'm saying as a, as, a, as a fan on the street, if I were to run into him and go, hey, Mike, I want to show you love. Yo, man, I love you. Blah, blah, blah. Is he going to be cool or is he going to make me want to go, man, that's why LeBron better than you. <laughs> I don't mean that. No, I think, I, I think he would come up, depending on how you rushed him, though. You know, if you if you came up like kind of hostile towards him, you know, and said it's a hey, Michael, you know, you came up in a in a non, you know, uh, violent way. You know what I'm saying? Like you just came up as just as a fan. Um, yeah, I think he would say what's up to you. Boom, 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 boom. Um, he's not that kind of guy like, you know, get the hell away from me. Leave me alone. I've never seen him um, turn a fan down or, or be a jerk to a fan. You know, I've never seen him do that. I've, I've never seen any te- any guys I've ever played with that are like that, including Scotty. It's really disappointing. You know, I, I know you probably see this too, with, you know, Scotty's take on MJ and all the things that is going on. Why you know, is he the, doing that? Why is he doing man, that? Man, you know what? If, you know, listen, <laughs> I play with both of them. And you know what? I will say this. You know, MJ probably wins maybe one title, two titles without Scotty. Um, that he doesn't win six. He doesn't win. He doesn't win six. I don't care how great he was. Scotty was that important to that team. Scotty and you ask anybody that's ever played with with on those teams, they will tell you Scotty was the glue of that team. Kept everybody in. You know, everybody involved. I, 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 I think anybody with common sense knows that. I mean, you, you know, when when people on social media bring that up as an arguing point. Well, you know, he didn't win nothing without Scotty. Well, duh. Yeah. No one wins alone. Exactly. So, and, and 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 Michael and Michael said 
in his uh, Hall of Fame speech. Anytime you saw me, you saw Scotty. So he gave him his credit. Yes, so yes. I don't know what Scotty is I think about. I honestly think because I do know behind the scenes of The Last Dance, um, the portrayal of Scotty in The Last Dance when they brought up the 1.8 seconds and how Scotty set out because of his back, you know, and missed training camp and that kind of, in Scotty's eyes, not in everybody else's eyes, but in Scotty's eye, that painted him in a different light that he didn't like. Because honestly, that 1.8 seconds, MJ wasn't on the team. MJ was off, was retired, and that was Scotty and Ku Coach and you know Horace Grant and Bill Cartwright. That was that team. So so MJ had nothing to do with that 1.8 seconds when Scotty didn't want to go in the game, and for that to be in the uh, the documentary, I think it, it rubbed Scotty the wrong way. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of guys. I mean, Horace Grant didn't like the way he was portrayed in there. So um, when I tell people when they ask me how true it was, how true was the last dance? And you know, I always tell people first. I was in the first dance, the one that really mattered. OK, um, <laughs> you know, the second dance, you know, they you know, we had already won titles then we'd already set the the, the tone. Um, but I, I will say this about that. I mean, you know, to be on a team like that is like being in a rock band. You're not always going to get along. You know, there's always going to be one person that gets more attention than others. And if you if you're a guy who can accept that and accept your role, because, you know, the pie is big enough for everybody. You know, MJ ain't going to be able to eat everything. You know, he's going to get, there's going to be other opportunities for other people. And I think, you know, there's Batman, there's Robin, and then nobody wants to be Alfred. But, <laughs> but I'll be Robin. I'll be the second man. I, hey, I'll be, I'll, I'll be Robin to Batman, but nobody wants to be Alfred. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> nobody wants to be that third guy. So I can see why certain guys, you know, who are in that third role upset. But, you know, Scotty is a great guy, one of my best teammates. And it's just, I, I'm just sad that, you know, he, you know, has gone at MJ the way he has because everyone knows Scotty's a top 75 player. He doesn't, no one, there's not one person who knows basketball would not put him as one of the greatest small forwards of all time. And he's getting his recognition um, from the outside people. I think Scotty just wants more love. You know, he he hears it from people saying, well, you know what, you know, man, Michael Jordan was the greatest player. And, and, and I think in his mind, it's like that uncle that hardly comes to barbecues. But when he does, you know, he always talking about what he used to do. And then no one gave him credit. And he just get all the ribs and leave. That's that's Scotty. This guy just get all the ribs and leave. I don't want to talk to nobody. Yeah, I'm the greatest. I'm the, I, They could have done it without me. Get my ribs. I'm going home. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, it's sad, man, <laughs> yeah. because because their I, I, friendship I, might they yeah, ne- they may not ever have a friendship. That's crazy, and and you would think that. that- he could call Michael and talk to him personally and vice versa. Yes, you can. They, I mean, they, they, they play golf together. Um, I know IMJ is, you know, I, MJ's vindictive. <laughs> MJ, you, you might not ever be able to call MJ again. Scotty might not ever be able to call him again because of that. Cause if, because that's almost like you're being betrayed in a sense. Okay. Let me Stacey. I got another question for you. Um, the, the team that you played on that won the first three championships, versus the Golden State Warriors with KD. Do y'all win that series? Yeah. All six of those teams beat them. All six of okay. them. And, and the reason why I say that is because, first of all, you're getting a prime MJ in that first repeat. You're getting a killer. There, nobody on their team could have matched up with them. And Scotty was, was right in his prime. So you're getting a young pip. You're still getting a, a young MJ, but Horace. a killer MJ. You get Horace, who who defensively they wouldn't have been able to do anything against against our team. And that's not taking anything away from them. The league, as you know, is totally different. The hand check, the aggressiveness of defense. They want to say three point shooting, but you know how can you make threes if you're being guarded? You know, you know Steph Curry, right. Steph Curry, Steph Curry gonna get threes no matter what. But you got to remember, he got to guard somebody on the other end. Who he gonna hide from? Who, where are you going to hide him on defense? You got MJ, Scotty, Horace, right. Bill Cartwright. You ain't going to be on a pick and roll where they switch you know, guards with bigs now. You're going to switch on Bill Cartwright in the post with a guard? Man, please. Bill Cartwright hit you one of them elbows and, and, and one. <laughs> yeah. and, and then you throw that second three-peat out there. Uh, you got Ron Harper. Look at the guard spot. Six foot six point guard Ron that's Harper. Not, six not, six not six saying. two guard and MJ. Six seven uh, Scotty Pippen and Dennis Robin, who does what Draymond Green does right now. Except, I mean, he might even be a better three point shooter than Draymond. But you got four Hall of Famers, three Hall of Famers on that roster. There's no way. So I'm when telling they- you, man, I, I, 
I get into arguments with cats on, on, on social media with this, like you would have thought I played for the Bulls. Yeah. I take it personal. And you know, a funny thing, because when, when I see Kenny Smith and, and Robert Ory and all these guys from Houston, you know, we always, we, you know, they always talk about, y'all wouldn't have beat us. Y'all wouldn't have beat us. Okay. The mark of a good team, if Houston was so good, why didn't they win three in a row? Mm. Why didn't you win three in a row? If you were so dominant with a dominant Hakeem Olajuwon, why didn't y'all win three three championships in a row? The Bulls won three, took two years off. MJ comes back and wins three more. So we're telling you right now, realistically, you wouldn't have won those two titles if MJ wouldn't have went to go chase curveballs. So you're looking at eight mm. straight championships. Okay, and I'll even go back one more even in the in the 89-90 season where Scotty has the migraine headache in game seven against the Pistons. If Scotty's healthy, we lose John Paxson in game six. If if we don't lose John Paxson in game six with a hurt knee and Scotty with a migraine headache, you may be looking at the Bulls winning that championship that the Pistons got in 90. But people think people think all oh, because because people think Aries people think that because you know oh you guys didn't beat the 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 uh, Houston Rockets during the regular season regular season don't count New York beat us four straight games you know in '93 they beat us four times they we, they swept us in in the uh, in the uh, you know regular season they killed us Detroit let swept us what, let me tell you what really gets under my skin and and I think this has more to do with this younger generation when they go and they say this often. You know, Michael played in an era where he played against truck drivers yeah. and handymen. And I go, wait a minute. So you telling me, and I can reel off the names, Barkley and so-and-so and so-and-so and so on. Those guys are all-stars and Hall of Famers. Like, I don't get this thing where they go, today's athletes are bigger, stronger, faster. But I go, those same athletes you're talking about do rest management. Michael's yes. era... Played all 82 yes. games. They didn't do rest management. And for all of this bigger, stronger, faster, what am I really looking at today that wasn't already shown to us? Exactly. I don't understand that. Exactly. That's the big argument that you have with this generation is that, that you know, like they're bigger and stronger. You know, Kevin Durant, seven foot three, you know, small forward. I mean, there was big, big 16, less 6'11 glues shooting back then, too. You know, the guard play. You look at Mark Price. You know, Mark Price is doing what Steph Curry's doing right now. You know, I mean, so there's a lot of guys um, when you look back at those eras and, and you compare today's guys, you know, could could they come in and play in our era where there was hand checking elbows, uh, the physicality, you know, things that are flagrant ones and twos in this era are regular fouls in the 90s in early 2000s. OK, so what do you think Michael would do in his prime in this era? If he can average career average over 30 points in an era where people are grabbing, holding, tackling, the Jordan rules was created for him. Imagine what he would do when you can't touch him and you can't put a hand on him. And with his quickness and his explosive ability to get to the rim, I mean, Michael's dunking on seven footers. How many guys do you see in this league now, the superstar players that can take the ball to the rim and, and bam on somebody on a regular basis? Like MJ understood. <laughs> Yeah, MJ understood what showmanship was. And on top of that, when you guys won championships, you, you didn't use goggles because you could handle champagne ski. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. No one, that's, you know, now that about, we didn't use goggles. Our eyes was burning like a mug. I was like, but yeah, it, it's it's funny though when you start talking about these errors, man. And and I get a big kick out of it because we live in the era. Of what what have you done for me lately? You know, and and a lot of this generation didn't even know who Michael Jordan was up until the Last Dance. They just thought he was the guy that sold shoes. But when they saw the Last Dance. See, their parents have been telling them about Michael. Let me tell you something. Y'all think LeBron is great. Y'all right. think Steph Curry is great. Y'all didn't see Michael Jordan play. Ah, I went on the, and that the guy that sells shoes. But then when that last dance came out, they got introduced to what everybody else knew. Their parents, their grandparents, their relatives knew how great this guy was. And they saw him as like, oh, my God. Like, this dude was for real. Yeah. And then they go back and yeah. get, you know, come fly with me videos. You know, videos that are all dusty now. They went back and started looking at that. They were like, man, this dude was a killer. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, we can see. Yeah, that's the one dude. I, that's the one dude who I I haven't met. Where I go, if I meet him, man, I'd be so scared because I just wouldn't want him to kind of shun me. 
you know, I've met my. No, nah, he wouldn't I shun you. He wouldn't shun you, especially, especially because you know MJ likes likes uh, comedy too. So he would know who you were, you know, and he he would he wouldn't he wouldn't shun you, man. I, I hope you get a chance to meet him, man. He's a lot more mellow now than than what he was, you know. Um, you know, he's got kids. You know, he's got you know right. some little kids now. Got remarried. Uh, you know, the Charlotte Hornets team is, is going to be pretty good here in the next few years. They got some really good, you know, good talent down there. We always see them when we go to, uh, you know, we go down to Charlotte. And it's really cool because, like, all those guys who played on those championship teams, as you know, it's like it's a fraternity, man. NBA is a fraternity. You know, I mean, there's guys that I hated when I played that we like we tight now, you know, like we put all that, you know, we put all that stuff with the right. Pistons and the Knicks down. And it's like, OK, we all cool now. But back in the day, man, if I saw you on the street, you saw me on the street, it'd be like the OK Corral. We'd be ready to go like on site. And right. this and this generation of right. guys, everybody's friends, everybody's buddies. You know, they all riding the banana boats. They all having a good time, and you know, we working out together. And you know, we all putting you know baby oil on each other in in the Bahamas. You know, we we wasn't doing all that. Dudes working out with one another. See, MJ would never call Larry Bird up and say, "Hey, man, let's get together and work out." Hey, Isaiah, let's get to work together and work out. Magic, let's get together because MJ was always about trying to beat those guys. Those are the guys he was trying to destroy. And this generation of guys, man, everybody works out and, uh, you know, they're all buddies and you don't have, think about this. You've been around this game for a long time. There's no rivalries. There's not, you know, back in the day you had teams that actually hated each other. The fans hated each other. I mean, it, it went beyond basketball. Now it's like, you know, it's like when the game is over, Hey man, what do you want to go out to eat? You know, let's go over here. You know, I mean, we wasn't trying to be friends with nobody. I mean, you know, yeah, it's hard to form a rivalry when you're busy trying to, you know, form the, the Avengers. Yes. You know what I mean? They're they trying to make Marvel alliances. Yes. So it's like, you know, how can we form a rivalry if, you know, one year we, we hate each other and the next year we playing together? Yeah, yeah. That's That's been the big difference is seeing these. And I'm not mad. I mean, the generation has changed, but it, it goes even back to AAU ball. Like when I came up coming up through AAU ball, you play for your state. I didn't. I wasn't. You know, Stacy King flying to California to play for the Compton All Stars. I had to play for my state. So Oklahoma would play California, Las Vegas, New York City. You know, the Gauchos. You know, we playing those teams, and all those kids were from those areas. Now, you know, kids get bought. You know, kids. You, you put an All Star team together from kids all over the country, and Nike sponsor them, Adidas is sponsor them. So they all learn how to be buddy buddy during those formats at the high school level. And so therefore you lose the competition where we were looking at street and Smith and we were looking at all these magazines. I was like, who's the top player, you know, in, in New York city. Oh, that's Rod Strickland. That's, you know, boo Harvey. You know, you're looking at all those kind of guys. And you say, I can't wait to get them in the AAU game. And I want to show these guys, you know, what I can do, you know, a kid from Oklahoma can do. And so you don't have that anymore. Mm. Facts. Sierra, it's it's tough to follow Stacy King on his own show. You know, you know when, you're, you're, when you're appearing somewhere and, and there's that one guy you don't want to follow, that's Stacy King. <laughs> well, that that's that's the, that's the equivalent to me in the comedy world. Yeah, yep. That, yep. exactly. You don't want to come out behind the, the headliner, baby. You don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. Just want to throw in the white towels and no. say, "I'll do it next time." Aries, we want to thank you so much for spending time with us this <laughs> afternoon. We Good luck with your show in Louisville, and we look forward to seeing you in Schaumburg and wherever else you're going to be in the Chicago area coming up this summer. Thank you very much, fellas. And again, y'all, uh, hit me up on Instagram, Aries Spears. Uh, slide in the DM. Let me give you the, the links to the Spears and Steinberg podcast, available on all streaming platforms. Thank you, fellas. Safe thank travels, guys. buddy. Have a good show in Louisville. The great Aries Spears joining us on Gimme the Hot Sauce. You don't need an invitation, Tim. You can go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> music, music made it out. Well, thank you. Go ahead and read the spot, all right? <laughs> oh, man. I was Manny choked. Oh, you you give him a chance. Say he had opportunity. You know, we, could, we could fix it in editing, but we're not going to. No, we're not. We're going to leave it right there. <laughs> why, See, we why, gave why, the cue. When the music comes on, yeah. Tim, read the commercial. This oh. is episode 78. This oh. is not the first rodeo. Come on, man. Really? What's happening? No, come on. Tito Jackson. <laughs> Tito. Tito Jackson. There's a reason why Michael's <laughs> the lead man and everybody else is behind him. Excuse me. Tito. If you like hot sauce, <laughs> then you're listening to the right show. Give me the hot sauce has the best small batch organic sauces to spice Even up your Even Bob kitchen. was laughing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Chicago style red sauce with a garlic twist. Our St. Pat's Verde green sauce with extra avocado and cilantro. And our King's Q, a bold, spicy, and sweet sauce just like our host. <laughs> what, what about the new version? What, what about, about the new version? You forgot about that. Yeah, well, if you want to hurt yourself, get our 1871. <laughs> and don't Wait. shake it with the cap off. If you get in your eye, you'll be blind. <laughs> Way to scare off our, our yeah. Come on about. now, yeah. yeah we had it's a our, great product. We had yeah. up our uh, liability insurance. That we <laughs> brought that out. Well, we might we, we might be hearing from Howard. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we got him on standby. Personal yeah. injury. <laughs> Personal injury. Yeah. Got hot sauce yeah. in the eye. <laughs> the Chicago Fire. Eighteen seventy one. We we put his number on the label. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, who's code hot sauce 21 to get 21 percent off your first order that's hot sauce 21 for 21 percent off that's g-i-m-m-e the hot sauce.com you know what we have to do we, we have to put on the website you know some video of tim like packaging up the hot sauce and getting yeah, it out there because this working. is working this is a one-man operation yeah it is it's a it lot is. of work it's, it's a lot of work and 30 years of abuse <laughs> i've asked pavel uh, to know. help and he says no <laughs> no we just put no. a chain around his ankle yeah. and tie him up in the corner yeah and he's, yeah he's and packaging then he's got, hot sauce yeah he's back there in the corner yeah. back there working like it's a yeah. sweatshop back here yeah wondering where the tape's at yeah yeah <laughs> so when you get your hot sauce uh ladies and gentlemen it's been packaged by Timmy Whispers. Yeah. You also get a man card. Yeah. Get a man card. Yes. Stacey's yes. 21 rules and how to live your life yes. like a man. Listen, <laughs> it wasn't all my rules, America. I only have a few of them. Those are, all, those are Whispers rules. Yeah, don't okay. try to don't kiss Stacey. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, don't. Yeah, listen, there ain't no kissing Stacey Jane. If you, if you a guy, I'm sorry. Shake my hand. Hey, congratulations, Stacey. Don't be trying to get the lips, brother. No. Please and thank you. Otherwise, you might no. get a two-piece that we're you, not talking about two, chicken. Hey, you ain't lying. We ain't talking about church's chicken either. All right? I, I'm talking about Floyd Mayweather. Pop, pop. I'm hey, hey speaking of boxing, there was an interesting uh, fight over the weekend. Canelo yes. Alvarez. Oh, my goodness. Canelo lost for the first time, I think, in, since he lost to Mayweather, which has been like double-digit years. And people talk about him as the greatest pound-for-pound pound fighter, and uh, he's going to lose that title. After yeah, he's going to lose it. You know, I give him credit, you know, you know, to go up and wait. Um, I, I watched the fight, and the one thing I took away from the fight was is that Canelo is very good at head movement, uh, quick hands, and outworking people. Like he's getting, like you know, he'll have eight hundred, nine hundred punches in a fight. This particular fight, he looked sluggish. He looked slow. Um, he just wasn't the same guy. The head movement wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And the fighter he fought, you know, uh, Bevel, Baval, or whatever, yeah, the Russian kid. Yeah, he was the real deal. Yeah. Like he was the real deal. I mean, he's, they were doing the amateur fights, you know, they were looking at the records, you know, and I think, uh, uh Beevil had like a, he was 19 and 0 with like 14 knockouts. So when you looked at his record, you thought like, oh, this is a cakewalk for Canelo. You know, Canelo's got 45 wins and he's got, you know, 25 knockouts. So this is an easy fight for him. But you didn't, what you didn't see was, and I don't think Canelo's handlers saw this. The dude had over 300 amateur fights. Yeah. And Canelo only had like 50 amateur fights so when you look at that you're getting an experienced fighter if you're going off his 19 and 0 record you think oh yeah i got a i got fresh meat i'm gonna get him whatever and i believe he didn't train as hard as he normally does i believe that he took this guy you know didn't take this guy seriously and he paid for it and the dude just outworked him he was bigger he, he was, was bigger. stronger i mean it was you know he, he he looked overmatched out there and he's got a rematch clause and he said he wanted to do the rematch right after the fight i, I text him yeah, no, I texted him. I said, "No, no, don't Yet. do that. Big, big mistake. Do not, do not, do not fight this guy again. There's just certain guy styles make fights. You can't do this. You can't fight this guy. This guy will beat you a second time and may knock you out. So you need to stay. He needs to stay in his weight class, which is like that 168. There's so many intriguing fights for him, and he's people saying he's ducking like the Charlo brothers. You've got, you know, Earl Spence, who's like at 147 now. He's the welterweight champion, and he's talking about he wants to move up to like 164 and wants Canelo to come down. Canelo fights at 168, so Spence wants him to come down to 164 in a catch weight, and they'll fight. And that will be a heck of a fight because I think, you know, before I was giving it, I was saying that Canelo, it'd be tough to beat Canelo because he's so much – more advanced than everybody else but just watching him this last time he had a lot of holes in his game and a guy who's a pressure fighter um you know canelo's a pressure fighter 
This guy pressured Canelo. Most people who fight Canelo are constantly moving away from him, not giving him, not staying in front of him because he's so dangerous. And this guy stood right in his face and did to him what he does to other people. And I think it caught him off guard. And I, Spence is that type of fighter. Spence will be in his in his jock strap the whole 12, 13, 14 rounds. He'll be right in his face. And it would be an exciting fight, but I give it to Spence. This wasn't last weekend, but the weekend before, I saw Shakur Stevenson put yes. on an impressive uh, display. He, he's yes. a, you know, a classic boxer. Yes. I'm not trying to knock you out necessarily. I mean, he'll knock you out when he gets a chance, but he's a guy that fights very stylistically, is going to pile up the points on you, and he's a guy I think going to be a rising star. In this he, he's got that Floyd Mayweather, uh, that quickness, that slickness in the ring. You know, he gets in and gets out, hits you three or four times, and he's gone, and you're swinging looking for him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got that type of that Floyd Mayweather rolling with the punches, very hard to hit. Um, where I think he's where he's going to get in trouble is there's a there's a guy out there who's who's a, a maniac. Javante Davis, Tank Davis is a beast, and they're in the same weight class. That that lighter division at one thirty five mm-hmm. to one forty seven is nothing but killers. There's great fights everywhere, and, and boxing now is starting to come back. To being in the forefront where yeah. UFC was the the main thing, boxing now is putting the exciting fights together. You know because there's a guy named Al Heyman who's who's a promoter for you know Spence and he's uh, the Charlo brothers. He's got all these big David Benita, uh, Benavidez. Benavidez. Um, so he's got all these guys in his stable and he's making them all fight each other. And, you know, they're all getting paid, but it's, it's good for, it's, the game. It's good for yeah. boxing. Yeah. These guys are not waiting 10 years till they get past their prime. Like, you know, I would have loved to see Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather fight when they were in their prime. Like Sugar Ray Leonard did against Tommy Hearns. And, you know, you had Marvelous Marvin Hegler against Sugar Ray and, and, and Tommy Hearns, Roberto Duran. The best fighters always fought each other. And that's what made boxing mm-hmm. so great. And they gotten away from that. You know, uh, Tyson Fury. Like, I, you know, I, I didn't used to be a Tyson Fury fan. But I'm a big Tyson Fury fan. Ty- Tyson Fury is a heavyweight that moves like a, a middleweight. Like he doesn't fight like a big lumbering fighter. He's got great hands, great instinct. Um, I don't see anybody beating him. They're they're pro- uh, promoting a fight with uh, Engano, and and they're gonna use <laughs> they're gonna use UFC gloves, not boxing gloves, UFC gloves. And if you're Engano, you're fighting a guy. That's what he does. His box. You're not. You're not doing any UFC rules. It's straight boxing. But you're gonna have UFC, uh, UFC gloves. So it gives Engano a chance to if he can land one punch. But you're like the best heavyweights in the world can't hit this guy. And this guy, I mean, if if Wilder, who you know uh, Deontay Wilder, who's one of the hardest punching heavyweights, can't hurt Tyson Fury in a fight, what makes you think the UFC fighter Engano can do it? And you're you know you're setting yourself up for a disaster. I believe. I'll never forget we had. Uh... Ari Spears do his Muhammad Ali impersonation, which was spot on. Remember oh. when he fought a, a, a Japanese kickboxer at yeah. the end of his career? And yeah. he hurt him, too. Yeah. Well, you know what? That You know, when you when you fight these martial arts, you know, these guys who do martial arts, it's it's, it's a different realm for a boxer. Yeah. Because a boxer is so used to being on his toes and standing up, and it's a stand-up game. But when you're fighting a guy who's a UFC fighter, and you're in his realm, yeah. He's not going to stand up there and swing <laughs> no. with you. He's going to kick you in right. the legs. Yeah. He's going to tear your legs and chop you down. And that's right. what you see. And that's why you don't want to see. That's why boxers don't want to get in there and do UFC rules. Right. If we want to box like Conor McGregor, you know, Floyd Mayweather knew, like, I can't beat this dude in a, in a no. UFC fight. This dude will kill me. But if I make him come up to my world, now it, it balances out a little yeah. bit. And, and you saw they made a lot of money. And I think a lot of these UFC fighters who don't make a lot of money as it is in UFC, which is a joke. We've had some UFC fighters on, you know, uh, TJ Dillashaw, you know, talk about the pay and, you know, not being if you're not mm-hmm. one of the elite guys, you're not making the big money. So, um, you know, it's hard. Those guys have to go try to make money elsewhere. If that means going to the boxing ring after seeing Conor, Conor McGregor make 200 million just boxing, why can't I do it? Of course, the National Football League is still king here in the United States. They're going to have a two-hour special devoted here on Thursday night just for the schedule release. Two hours of talking about who's playing whom for 18 weeks in the National Football League. We did find out some of the games were leaked out. The Bears will open at Soldier Field against San Francisco. Sounds tough, but they may be bringing in Trey Lance for his one of his first starts, so they, that's maybe a winnable game. And then they go to Lambeau Field for a Sunday night game against Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. Stacy, I saw a ESPN power poll that had the Bears 
32nd out of 32 teams. That's frightening. Well, you know what? Maybe they'll pull, pull a situation like the Bulls did. You know, no one counted the Bulls to be very good. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're one of the elite teams in the NBA and make the playoffs. Um, I still think that, you know, them not getting the weapons for this kid. Yeah, no like, receivers. I mean, no receivers. I mean, yeah. come I mean, uh, we're going to develop. Well, man, you're going to get this kid killed. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, you got to have some kind of with his arm strength and his arm talent. You got to have a running back behind him that can take some pressure off of him with the play actions and handing it off, um, giving him short fields to work. Um, and you got to get him some some guys that can catch the ball. You know, somebody that that defense is fear. You know, like they'll take the top off the defense. Oh my God, this guy! You got to put two guys on him. You know, because this guy is so super fast. To not draft now, the kid they drafted out of Tennessee, Valus Jones yeah, Jr. I, I, is twenty five yeah, years old. Yeah, he's twenty five years old, and I, I mean, listen, at the at the combine, he looked awesome. Like yeah, I think he ran like a four three. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, good 40. kick return. You know what? I'm I'm one of these people that Mark that believe like the combine should be you should be wearing your pads. I want to see what you run the 40 in in full gear. Okay, because you're not out there yeah. playing naked. Okay, you're not out there in a thong <laughs> running around catching passes. Okay, I want to see. That's what they should do in the combine. They should make quarterbacks throw with their shoulder pads on. They should make guys run the 40 in their, in their full gear. Because yeah. I want to see how fast you are with pads because right. that's how we play. Just like when they take, you know, when the NBA, when they take your measurements when you come to the combine, you know, they take your measurements with your shoes off. And they say, okay, a guy could be seven feet uh, with his shoes on, but then when he takes his shoes off, he might be six ten. And they're like, oh, he's not seven feet. And they and that and they, that, that hurts him in the draft. Yeah, yeah, but who's out there playing barefooted? I know. Ain't nobody out there Crazy. running around with a pair of socks on, dunking. I mean, if you do that, man, you you got to be a great player to be running around with some <laughs> sliding all over the floor. Which uh, so that's why that's why I say, man, you know what? That stuff's overrated, and you know, hopefully, they'll get this kid some receivers because I don't want to see him go through the same thing that we've seen these other other quarterbacks go through. Trubisky, you know, lose confidence, and then all of a sudden you yeah. see their fan base get him out of here. He sucks. It's a terrible pick, <laughs> and it's really not his. It's really not his fault. It's the the front office people not doing their due diligence to put him in the best uh, place to succeed because he's a young quarterback. You got to remember now, you know, they're trying to do this Arlington Heights thing and you're trying to, you know, the Bears got a great fan base. They got a great fan fan base. So you want this kid to be your future. You want him to be the guy that's like Aaron Rodgers in the next five years that he's leading you to not only winning your division, but putting you in position to win a championship and you're coming to a new field, new area. So you want that kid to be the main guy. You don't want to be going through another quarterback, drafting another quarterback, you know, so they got to get it right. Yeah, the uh, Bears had a rookie mini camp last weekend. All their coordinators and head coach Matt Eberflus met the media. And Luke Getze, who came from Green Bay, the new offensive coordinator, just raved about Justin Fields' work ethic and said that he's picking up everything with the new system. He's really excited. He thinks that the sky's the limit for this kid. So hopefully big things ahead in year two for Justin Fields. Are we going to give Whispers another chance to do a, do a read? Yeah, or? Hey, no, Whispers no, are coming to you. Our good no, friends no, no, at Windy no, City no, Limousine. No, no, this is you, Whispers. I'm taking the day off. Oh, the geez. golden pipes are rusty. So you taking the day He's off. taking the day off, but his yeah. driver Gene is waiting outside. <laughs> yeah, Gene's waiting for me. <laughs> My man Gene. Shout yeah. out to Gene. Windy City Limousine provides championship service for Stacy, not Mark or I. <laughs> wow, he's bitter. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of There's hate lot of over bitterness. there. A lot yeah. of haters. Yeah. Haterism. Making reservation is so easy for Stacy. It's a slam dunk. Okay, man, you can stop using my name. Okay, <laughs> use it. Use it. The people, not me. Let Windy City break the full cord press of traffic, especially if they got Stacy in the back seat. Wow. Get you to your destination style and on time. Contact us at eight six six nine four Windy. What about that? Uh, the discount code. The promo code. Oh, there isn't one, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no one gets no, any deals. Stacy always says you can drop his name, but it may not help. It you may not help. Yeah. yeah, but you can try. You can try. You yeah. can try. Can't try. make any promises. Try hot sauce twenty one and see what yeah. happens. You know what, Tim? You're fired. You're you're, you're no longer reading oh, any more reads. No more reads. You were worse than my girlfriend Don. I thought Don was bad. My girlfriend Don. I thought she was bad. America. I thought she was bad. She's sitting right next to you. Is she here? Oh, I didn't know oh, she was here. She, she didn't, Mark. She didn't even have the headphones on. She can't hear me. So anyway, anyway, Pavel America does the reads next week. America, no, Pablo, no, no, Pablo, no. Pablo don't even. Pablo, when I text Pablo, me and Mark text yeah. Pablo, he can't even read the text. How the hell are you gonna read a read? We're gonna text him in Braille next. No, time. I, I text him in Russian. I, I actually got my little app that, that turns the text into Russian, yeah, yeah. and I text him. He still don't can't read it. I'm like, how can you be Russian and not be able to read a Russian text? 
I don't know what you say. Leave me alone. <laughs> don't talk to me. I'm like, okay. All he's right. just looking at his watch. Tell look us at it's, him. Look at him. He's it's ready to go. To look, at him. look at him. He's ready to go. Pablo, like he's on the clock. Perestroika <laughs> watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he hit Tim. He hit oh, you, Tim. Man, he ain't hitting me. Man, right? He ain't hitting me. It wasn't my fault. Well, anyway, America, but that, that's, we love you. Yeah, you can't bite the hand that feeds you. You heard that yes. expression in Russia? Can't bite the hand that feeds you? They, don't, they didn't get fed there. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Oh, 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 cancel. Cancel whispers. <laughs> oh, I, I think it's time to wrap it's up. It's time show. to wrap it up, man. Hey, Pavel, you got the uh, outro music for us? Let it roll. There you go. Episode 78 of Give Me the Hot Sauce. Coming to a close. We are limping to the finish line. I want to thank our guest, Ari Spears. He's going to be performing in Louisville if you're in that area this weekend. He'll be performing in Schaumburg when he gets back up to the Chicago area. We had a lot of fun on the show. We'll be back again next week, Stace. Drive home safely, Chicago. Beep, beep. And she'll like it, too. Thank you.